Let's get started by talking about what it is that we study in chemistry. So there's two main important things that we look at, matter and energy. We study both matter and energy in three different domains. Macroscopic, which is the large scale version of both matter and energy. Usually they're big enough that we can see them or we can sense them or we can measure them in some way. And then there's the microscopic version of matter and energy, which are so small, usually in the scale of atoms, electrons, and so on, that we can't really see directly. Now, what is the symbolic uh, representation? That's basically the equations that we use to relate the microscopic with the macroscopic. So when we use equations like the ideal gas equation, for example, we're basically trying to explain how the pressure of a gas, for example, in a balloon can be explained by the behavior of the gas molecules that are filling that balloon. Let's go now further to understand how matter is composed. So first off, what is matter? Well, matter is anything that occupies some space and has a mass. So basically everything around us, if you look in your room right now, you'll see a lot of examples of matter. Your desk, your computer, you know, even things that you can't really see, like the air around you, is an example of matter because it fills some space and if you capture it, it will have some mass. Now there's three different states of matter, as a lot of you have learned before. Solid is a state of matter that is rigid and has a specific shape. So again, your computer would be an example of a solid. It doesn't change its shape. Whether you, you put it in different places, it's still gonna have that same shape. A liquid, on the other hand, is going to take the shape of the container. So for example, water would be a really good example. If you just pour some water on the desk that you have in front of you right now or on the floor, that water is going to start to spread around, right? Because it's going to try to uh, adopt the shape of the container that it's being placed in. If you take that same water and pour it into a cup, then it's going to form the shape of that cup. A gas is the state of matter where it's going to take both the shape and the volume of the container. So it's going to fill up the whole space. It's not just going to take up a small little portion of that container. The drawing here really shows the difference between all of those three different states of matter. So if you have a solid block, for example, it's only going to occupy that small part of this whole flask and it's not going to look like the flask at all. In fact, it's the shape of it. It's going to be just the shape of that cube itself. If you have the same cube melted into a liquid form, now it's going to look like what the flask shape looks like instead of that defined shape of the cube that we originally had. If you heat that even further such that it all converts to gas, now that gas is not just going to be located at the bottom of the flask, but it's going to fill up the entire flask. And clearly it doesn't have a defined shape like the original cube. Now, another way we look at matter is we try to classify or separate them out or organize them based on their composition. So composition here means what are the specific microscopic components that make up matter? There's a couple of ways we can divide this. We can divide that into something called pure substances, or we can divide that into mixtures. So mixtures is just a combination of pure substances. So if you have pure substance A and B mixed together, that's called a mixture. The pure substance itself could be divided further into what we call an element and a compound. And again, the difference here between element and compound is very similar to the difference between a mixture and a pure substance. A compound is basically a number of elements that are connected together and they're connected together by a chemical bond, something we will explore a lot more later on. Examples of elements are things like, you know, sodium, for example, is an element. Hydrogen is an element. Uh, oxygen is an element. Now, the element oxygen and hydrogen can combine together forming water, which is a compound. In water, the hydrogen and oxygen elements are connected by chemical bonds. Now, what about mixtures? Well, mixtures can be separated into what we call homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures. The difference here is just that a homogeneous mixture is a mixture that when you look at it, you can't tell that there's two different things in there. So it's really differentiated by observation, by sight. So for example, if I have salt and water combined together, now you've all done this in, in at home, you mix some salt and you put it in water, you stir it. When you look at that solution containing both salt and water, 
it just looks like pure water. You can't tell the difference. The only way you can tell the difference is when you start tasting it. Then pure water doesn't taste like anything, whereas the salt water tastes salty. So that's what a homogeneous solution is. You can't tell that there's more than one substance in it. Heterogeneous substances, on the other hand, is very easy to see. So if I have sand and water, for example, well, it's pretty clear that there is a solid in there, which is the sand, and then there's the liquid in there, which is uh, water. Another example of heterogeneous is a mixture of oil and water, for example, like in salad dressing. And so you can clearly see if you leave salad dressing in a container, you can see it separate out into its oil component and its water component. So that's also an example of a heterogeneous mixture. So mixtures can be separated using what we call physical separation methods, which are basically the way we separate things without actually changing the chemical nature of the different parts. So for example, like filtration. So if I have sand and water, just like I was talking about earlier as an example of a mixture, well, I can separate the sand from the water by filtration. So filtration means I have a funnel and then I have a filter paper, and then I pour that mixture of sand and water through the filter paper. The sand would get trapped in the filter paper. The water, on the other hand, would just flow through. When I separate those two, the sand is still sand. The water is still water. I haven't changed the chemical nature of those two components. They are still what they are in the mixture. It's just that I'm separating them apart. There are other ways of separating things physically. Distillation is another method that you will learn more in organic chemistry. Now, compounds, right, can be separated into elements. But in this case, because compounds and elements, the relationship between these two is that they're connected by chemical bonds, this is gonna require a chemical separation method. So you're not just gonna be able to filter water and then somehow separate out the hydrogen from the oxygen. In order to do that, you're really gonna to have to either heat it up, you're gonna to have to use electricity, you're gonna to have to do something that requires a lot more energy than just a physical separation. So those are called chemical separation. Another word for them is decomposition because you're basically taking elements that are connected with chemical bonds and you're decomposing, you're separating them apart into individual elements. One of the things that interests chemists is of course the way we can take matter in one form and change it to another form. So there's two different types of changes that we can see. The very common one is something called physical change. This is basically the change of the same substance from one state to another state. So when I showed you earlier the three different states of matter, if I take that solid and I melt it, becomes a liquid and I evaporate it and become a gas, those are physical changes. Okay, so I'm not really changing what it is I have in here chemically. So this could be ice, becomes liquid water, becomes steam, but the underlying compound that forms the ice, the liquid water, and the gas are all still the same thing, which is H2O, right? That's still water. Now, in chemical change, we're changing the molecule itself into something else. So when we take water and we run electricity through it and we break apart that water molecule into oxygen gas and hydrogen gas, that's a chemical change because the water no longer exists, okay? Now, by eye, when you look at the change between physical and chemical, it's really hard to tell. Sometimes, you know, there's bubbling occurring and bubbling alone doesn't tell you anything. It just tells you that a gas is being formed. Is the gas the same gas uh, chemically? Is it water that's in the gas form or is it hydrogen and oxygen gas? We don't know. We're going to need to make additional measurement to, to figure that out. But this is just to let you know that there's two different types of changes that could occur, physical and chemical. Now, just like in terms of changes, we have physical and chemical. In terms of properties, we also have physical and chemical properties. So what is a property? Well, a property is something that a particular uh, sample of matter has, right? For example, you know, if I look at my a piece of paper, well, what is its property? Well, I can tear it pretty easily, at least compared to like a piece of wood, for example, right? And I can write on it. I can use a marker to write on it, uh, which is say, for example, different than if I compare that to liquid water where I can not write using a piece of marker on liquid water. So there are certain properties that are different between samples of matter. Now physical property is the property of that matter that you can look at without having to change again its, its fundamental composition. When I tear the paper, I'm really not changing what makes up paper. It's still the same molecule. Uh, in this case, 
cellulose. Now, there is another property, which is uh, the property that we can only find out if we change the chemical nature of that substance. So for example, if I burn paper, well, when I burn it, I, I'm changing the chemical nature of paper. At that point, that cellulose that makes up the paper no longer exists because when I burn something, I'm really reacting it. I add another component, in this case, oxygen, to convert my cellulose into something else. So flammability is considered a chemical property. Of course, different substances burn differently, right? Water doesn't burn at all. Paper burns pretty easily. The volume, how much space it takes up. Uh, can it conduct electricity? Again, doing uh, measuring that doesn't require you to change the nature of the material extensive and intensive properties. This is uh, the way we look at property based on their ability to change with mass. So certain properties, if the mass gets bigger, the, the value of that property will also get bigger. So for example, volume would be one. So for most substances, when you increase your mass, the volume also goes up accordingly, okay? Energy is another one, right? So just think about collisions between two objects with a bicycle versus a car, right? The bicycle and the car going at the same speed, the collision with the car would transfer a lot more energy because the car has a larger mass. So energy then is an extensive property. The value of the energy is proportional to the amount of mass that it has. So intensive property is the opposite. It's a property where it doesn't really depend on mass. So whether your uh, mass is really large or really small, the value of that property doesn't change. So what's an example of that? Well, anything related to temperature. So for example, like the melting point of ice, it's zero degrees Celsius. So if you have one small cube of ice or a huge amount of ice, like the one I showed you earlier in that iceberg, right? Whether it's this size of ice or this size of ice, the melting point is still zero degrees Celsius. So the melting point doesn't depend on how much ice you have. The mass of ice is just always zero degrees Celsius. So that's what we call intensive property. There are some other intensive properties that I'm listing here. Density is one that we'll talk a little bit more about. Concentration or molarity is another one that we would discuss a little bit further in a few more chapters.